and your reaper. Those kids out there seem mad thirsty. You got something for them to drink? Yo, we could wet up two cups of blood. <laughs> Welcome back. Oh my god. 2019 is over. It's done. Fucking it's, hell. It's only it's only the uh, 10th of January 2020 and I feel like I feel like New Year's Eve was like a month ago. I feel like it was to to think <laughs> only 10 days has gone by is kind of baffling. It's true. Uh yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> we had a, a good relaxed New Year's Eve. Yeah, a fantastic New Year's Eve. Um, it was a mo- moderation of excess. Is that the best way to describe it? It's not bad. Not a bad way to describe yeah. it. Oh wait, we're we're all ahead of ourselves. We're what? acting like everyone's familiar. I'm Mechno. Oh yes, and I'm Matt DJ Velocet, also known as Velocinate. And this is Two Cups of Blood. It is. And you're our cherished listeners. As always. Or listener. All five. Love yeah, you. all of you. All yes. bless your hearts. And uh, this is our, our special fireside chat yeah. edition. Uh, we're at uh, the upper floor of Mechnopolis. There is a cabin in the woods in the attic. <laughs> and it it really feels like that to me. And I like that. Um yeah, we have a fire going, and we're just gonna we're gonna do the 2019 year in review, minus the stuff that you'd rather not think about. Yeah, as much as possible. Yeah, hey. <laughs> a little bit. I don't know. I don't know how much we're gonna spend on this last year because it wasn't the best of years for me. Well, there were some good movies. There were some good music. There were some good video games. True. So uh, there was some good events that we attended and yes you know so hey i think we got some stuff to chat about well let's talk about our first cup first oh yeah that's right (laughs) forgive uh our breach of decorum there were elements of this that were prepared to taste so we don't have that like shocking reveal where we're like oh this is fucking horrible we really tanked it this time no, this is uh, actually pretty interesting. Um, what was the name of this? It's just the oh, you know, absinthe eggnog. Yeah, it's an absinthe eggnog. That's it. That's it precisely. So because we're absinthe, you know, freaks, uh, I take any chance to try a new concoction with absinthe. And for something sort of holiday themed ish, yeah, in a way, yeah, uh, I thought Seasonal this would be fun. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, was not made with store-bought eggnog. This is all made fresh. And um, it's, it's, if you're into absinthe, it's, it's actually pretty good. If you're, if you're an, absinthe, an absinthe novice, uh, you might want to cut down the amount of absinthe in this because it does come through not super strong, but it's very noticeable. I think that I've just, my palate has sort of evolved to be very welcoming to absinthe because I find this really to be the best eggnog I've had. Oh, wow. Like, so I'm going to be recalling from memory the this recipe, but I feel pretty confident that I can do it. It's a, an ounce and a half of absinthe, an ounce and a half of heavy cream, uh, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, an egg... A half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Yep. So you take that and you shake it to combine. Then you add some ice and then you shake it, shake it vigorously to to bring it down to cool. Yep. Um, and I gotta say, like I was, even though my historical and uh, logical brain says. There's been raw egg in cocktails for a very long time. Like, it's like going back to Prohibition days. Prohibition cocktails had some some egg white, some whole egg, all that. Um, and I would think 
it would, like, I was prepared for it to be nasty, but it's just nice. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty good. Um, for I mean, it tastes very smooth, very creamy, very not scary or weird in any way, except for the absinthe element if you're not used to it. So, I think it's pretty it's pretty different as far as like a spiked absinthe goes or a spiked uh, eggnog goes. Excuse Both, me. Both really, it's it's <laughs> atypical of an eggnog and atypical of an absinthe cocktail because. Most of the time when I think absinthe and cream, I don't necessarily <laughs> see that as a winner. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, with this recipe, you can add more simple syrup and or more vanilla to taste. Which we did. And we put a little uh, nutmeg on top for the hell of it. Because, yeah. Because, you know, that's what you do. Sometimes. So, yeah, I'd say it's pretty successful. And for for being one of those raw egg things, concoctions, you know... That we mixed up ourselves. I've certainly have never tried to do that before. Yeah. Um, it wasn't difficult, and it turned out pretty damn good. I so. am impressed overall. Yeah. Like, uh, I guess I should say, because I'm stupid and still doing keto, because I don't really know why, but it's just the, <laughs> what, can, what I'm compelled to do, um, I will say that you can make this, this a keto drink-ish by you making an erythol based simple syrup simple combination of half cup erythol with one cup water heat it and then add one sixteenth of a teaspoon of xanthan gum to thicken it to a sort of simple syrup-esque consistency it, a little goes a long way so one sixteenth of a tablespoon which I measured just by sticking the end of a butter knife into the bag and whatever was sort of on the tip. I was like, okay, good enough. Nice. Yeah, and uh, it's good. Excellent. It's not It's not disgusting, which is really, that's, that's a victory goal. in, in yeah. the keto world. Is if, it's, <laughs> if it's still consumable, you've done, you've done a great job, son. All right. Yeah, this is cool. So we have sort of a holiday drink by the fire, and... Uh, this uh, often, you know, between the two of us, I often threaten to try to do a remote recording. We've tried when we've, uh, you know, we've done some events or like sort of vacationy things together, and uh, I've tr- I've brought the rig out a couple times, but this is our first real remote recording. So this is the beta site. It only took you know two and a half, three years, and yeah. here we are. Well, I think you know. <laughs> I think it's amazing how you got this rig so so trimmed down and portable. Uh, it's not it's not bad. It's it's pretty easy these days. Pretty you know, manageable. A laptop and a little interface and some microphones. You're good to go. Not too bad. I think uh, I think it's really cute, and I look forward to the possibility having having done it here. The possibility of other future location events like we're in a cave oh jesus yeah caving (laughs) um so i guess do you have any new year's resolutions it's not something that um uh usually i'm like fuck that i'm not doing that shit that's a mistake to yeah to to do like to lean into like all this shit you want to change about your life and like promise yourself it's like it's kind of a general recipe for disaster like i promise this time i'm gonna do better yeah i think it's okay to have like general trends like i'm going to try to do this more or this less or whatever right um yeah i didn't make any i'm not really a resolution i don't really do that but you know you do reflect and you think about what you know what you can do differently or maybe where you should be concentrating your energy i kind of uh got to a place where i really decided i need to like reach out uh more when i'm feeling you know down and uh learn to lean on my friends a little bit more and open up about you know just where i'm at and trying to get together with people instead of kind of isolating so that's 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 what I decided. You know, that's something of an inspiration to me because I think and I I would not be shocked if if it was like 
pretty prevalent in our goth culture that like if you're dealing with something hard you bottle it up and that's what too many people do despite being surrounded by really close and concerned and loving friends it's just like this this thing where like I don't have time to feel the way I do, so I'm just going to, like, compress it down and, you know, among yeah. other reasons. Yeah, I think um, certainly online, not necessarily as much, well, I guess in person, too. I feel like I really don't want to be one of those people that just is constantly complaining about their life or, yeah. hey, this happened to me and that sucks and oh, then this shitty thing happened. Like, I don't want to be that person. <laughs> like, I want to be a, a fun person to be around. But sure. You know, sometimes you just can't do it. <laughs> but I think I think the the positive angle is that your friends already know that you're a fun person. <coughs> Ew. Do you need help with that? As a caring friend, <laughs> are you all right? I'm good. Okay. Got a little get a little eggnog up in the south oh, palate. Yeah. You know? The nog in the corner <coughs> pocket, right? Yeah. Um. I think that's a really positive thing, which is. I think it seems like a phase of emotional growth to to like reach out rather than to curl in when when you're feeling stress and and uh, pressure. Yeah, I'm one of those people that feels like I'm imposing all the time, and it's like you know I want I don't want to uh, do that to the people. I don't know. It's it's hard to explain, but it just. It's one of those things where you don't want to burden somebody with your bullshit. And I think if if they're, you know, an actual... If, if they are your friend, they'll be willing to listen to you if you're not unloading on them all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, hmm. It's one of those things, man. Like, you definitely are not a burden on your friends. And you don't... I think this the 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 culture is is got a lot of both kind of personalities ones that never express that they need help or could use help. Need is not the right term cuz they're they'll get through whatever they're getting through. They yeah. certainly could use help. But then there's like a subset of people who intentionally put themselves into bad situations because they like the attention that they get when they're the target of sympathy. Mm. And I think to recognize if you to recognize which which personality set and I'm not being judgmental of either because everyone, you know, everyone has the same basic needs. They just have different methodology about meeting those needs. So like mm. you have to understand if you're somebody who sabotages yourself because you're addicted to the attention you get when your friends help then you know maybe be a better friend to yourself and like let let yourself thrive a bit but if you're someone who just takes on everything on themselves and never reaches out then trying to hey it's fucking 2020 we're in the future yeah Wow. <laughs> keto is... I'm feeling this already. All like, right. Keto is heck of a... And you just ate, too. Yeah, it's... That's crazy. That's the thing, man. <laughs> it's like quadruple effect. When you're, Hey, that's a selling point. <laughs> it is if a selling point. If you want to, like... You have to be responsible, though. You do. You have to and cut your... If you have, like, a four-drink limit, you better cut that shit in half, right? Def well, yeah... My hesitation was really misplaced. <laughs> yes, you should cut that shit in half. Okay. <laughs> like, it's bad judgment, because the other night I I thought I could just sit and, and drink absinthe the way I used to, mm. and it, absinthe's a very potent thing, and I was yeah. just having it over, over ice, and I had had, like... <laughs> I had had maybe 16 ounces of absinthe Jesus. over the course of an evening, which... Had I, you know, not been like compromised, it would have been fine. It would have, I would have been drunk as a skunk, but yeah. still wouldn't have been sick. Right. But like, yeah, you got one bit you. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, hey, hey, hey. First, uh, 
vomiting drunkenness of 2020. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, I think, you know, that's the thing about bad experiences. If you get, if you get them out of the way early in a process, they can be really good, like, milestone teaching, like, points. Like, okay, now I remember that vomit coming out through my nose hurts, and Ugh. I don't like that. Yeah. Oh, man, I was so rough. I had, like, burst capillaries in my eye. Oh, like, dude. It was, it was great. <laughs> like, I felt a little rough the next day, but... yeah. But whatever, man. The keto has a quick recovery. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, either your metabolism gets that out. Yeah, I, I skipped. I skipped a workout day, and then, you know, just took a chill out day. Actually, no, I broke keto that day. Oh. I was so rough that I had uh, one of the Dunkin' Donuts Beyond sausage breakfast sandwiches. How was that? It was great. Is it actually beyond? Yeah, beyond they're me? they're going beyond not impossible. Oh, good for them! But I, you know, I pulled up, ordered six of them. I'm sure it really annoyed them that like the guy at the drive-through ordered six beyond breakfast sandwiches. Whatever, that's that's not unheard of. I don't think it's that crazy. But no. I was, you know, I had a bunch of like severely compromised people at my house. I wanted to make sure everyone had. As much breakfast sandwiches as they could. That shit's medicine. <laughs> when when you're fucked up, breakfast sandwiches are where it's at. Nice. So, yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's kind of the nice thing about it is if, if, you're, if your departure from keto isn't all that long, you get back into it really quickly. So it, it took like two days and I was back in. Cool. So it's good to be back. All right. Woo! Uh, do I have any New Year's resolutions? Not really. I mean, starting in November, um, I wanted to, like, take better control of my physical fitness. Mm. So it's not really that I'm trying to get, like, buff or swole or built or yoked or any of that. <laughs> it's that, like, I have this theory that, okay, I did kind of just make this theory up, so it's... <laughs> But I have this theory that when you regularly increase your circulation rate, you'll see, like, a bunch of other pleasant side effects. Like, you'll heal from things faster, and you'll, you'll get better cognitive function, and things like that, that will just come from intermittent increases in your, in your circulation and metabolic rate. And my fi my like observations seem to support that. I'm not super sciencey about it. I'm not keeping a detailed journal or anything. But my main thing was like, you remember I messed my shoulder up. Yeah. And I really wanted my shoulder to be back in a better state. So I started strengthening that and you know working out pretty regularly. And I think it I think it worked. Cool. I didn't become a knucklehead, did I? Like, or a meathead? What no, is it called? Not yet. Joe Rogan? I, I, <laughs> what would Joe Rogan call it? A gorilla, bro. I don't know. Yeah. Something. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's good. I've been having some trouble with my shoulder now these days. <laughs> but uh, no, no big injury. Just, uh, I don't know what yet. Well... But yeah, so looking back, yeah, 2019. You know, I think there was a lot of bullshit, but when I frame it in terms of the arts as a general lens, it's it's pretty positive. Yeah, it wasn't so bad. Um, yeah, all my stuff was like personal, just you know, life shit. So yeah. Well, there was there was good movies. There were good games. There was good music that came out. Um, what uh, what would you put up there for your release of the year, music wise? Oh, that's tough. You know, um, you got some I, candidates. I gotta break it down into sort of categories. I would say my artist of the year is def is gonna be Corlix. Oh, um, you know, it's just one of those things where their uh, Into the Skin album is just 
a pleasure to listen to start to finish. And sometimes you like a song, you like a couple songs on an album, but you feel like ambivalent or maybe even negative about other songs. But this album was like positive the whole way through and I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know. That said, I don't know if they're, if, if they had the, the claim to the number one jam of the year. Mm. The number one jam is tough. I didn't think about a number one jam. I feel like it's really, really hard because stuff that comes out at the end of the year has like absolute like it's got more impact it's cheating it's totally yeah. cheating it's like it, if you've been doing well at your job and you get your employee review and you've been like shit for nine months and then awesome for three you're fucking awesome you're done you're great pretty much so ah, oh, the jam that's tough <laughs> there's been some good jams What's what's been your favorite? Give me your top three uh, tracks you liked. Oh, it's totally weighted. It's totally not fair and totally weighted. But I think Rabbit Junk did like an amazing thing with the theme, with the the orchestral theme from the movie Dune. Um, they did something funny. It's kind of like if Dune was a remix of Nero's Doomsday. Like there's heavy elements of that. It's Dune Step. Yeah, but I really like Doomsday. <laughs> so, like, I was like, yeah, we needed this song back. <laughs> so I was, like, over the moon thrilled with that. Cool. Um, geez Louise, man. Uh, hmm. How about you? You know, I tried to think about it. I tried to look at some stuff. I tried to look back at what I bought on Bandcamp. Um... The thing that stuck out to me the most, that probably connected with me the most, was the Cultastic record, um, especially the first single that came out. It just struck a chord with me somehow. And the rest of the record, as it came out, I, the other songs I just didn't love as much, but they've grown on me a little bit, and now I kind of I dig the whole thing. So um, for me, that, that was where it was at. Um, there were a lot of contenders, you know. Um, a lot of stuff happened, you know. Stoneburner's been putting out stuff, and you know, uh, there's a, a lot of things that I've that I came into this year that didn't come out this year as well. So I've tried to like kind of that's tough. Sort How do you categorize out. that? Is that a 2019 because it's when you experienced it? Well, for me it is, but I'm not gonna say that. Oh, the best release of 2019 was. You know, whatever. Skinny Puppy's Weapon, because I rediscovered it. Or whatever. Well, I think you could call it your jam of 2019. Because I, you know, I'll be a goth obnoxious snob and say <laughs> that our culture leads societal trends. So we'll have shit that will sound appropriate two years after it came out. Mm. The people, like... Rest, rest, Keith's soul. But people like often when Prodigy would release a new album, it would get like initial medium reception, and then it would be like a year later, and people would like really embrace it. Like, oh shit, that is a fucking great album and great song. So like, the, the fringes influence the mainstream. I think yeah. that's always been the way. Absolutely. So yeah. So I think, you know, I think maybe, you know, stuff that came out 10 years ago, when you put it in the context of right now, that could be, you know, maybe Weapon is the number one jam of 2019. Well, it's funny how much stuff still sounds contemporary, and maybe it's just because I'm old, but like, you know, some of the music, especially some of the electronic music from the 90s that's well produced, like, still holds up, like... If you put on Smack My Bitch Up, mm -hmm. that song hasn't really aged. Like, I think that stands up. The sounds, yeah. the production, the whole thing. So it's really funny how that happens. It, Yeah, it really is. I think we might need to take a sh small break to save the dying fire if you want to try. It's, it's, it is burning. <laughs> but here, uh, 
I'll just say that I think my number one jam is The Sky Ablaze by Purple Fog Side. Ah. Um, there's, it's hard. I'm going to not narrow it down from that because there's, there's a remix album that's many different versions of that song. That's, I would like one of those. I can't remember which one. They're all amazing. Yeah. Like each has something different. Some are up tempo, some are down tempo, but they're all really, really compelling and beautiful. So cool. like, that that is my jam of 2019 honorable mention to black audio's re- like album release that sounds like devo but that shit is good and i saw it get dropped on a dance floor and it went over great people oh, cool. could handle it i wasn't sure if they could handle like this devo-esque black audio but they i i should never have doubted them they really had their shit together super sweet you can keep it going all right, well, well, we'll keep rolling here as uh, Mechno tries to save the fire. So yeah, it was a it was a pretty it was a pretty damn good year for music, to be quite honest. Um, I also started looking over some of the movies that had come out uh, over the year, and there was a lot of good stuff there as well. Um, for me, I think the best of 2019. You know, Avengers Endgame, I'm sure there's a lot of fans. Um, Certainly pretty good for me, but I think I have to say Terminator Dark Fate was probably the most fun, and both the most fun, technically good, and, you know, entertaining, had a decent story. It had all the elements. For me, I think that was the top of the heap. I am back for this. So I'm going to comment on both of those things, which is... Terminator, or not Terminator, I'll start with Avengers. Avengers Infinity War, I was very irritated that they gave us half a movie, and I didn't know it was half a movie, and all of the, like, for reasons inside and outside the movie, the, the losses that were suffered rang really hollow. I knew that there was another Spider-Man movie coming out, so when Spider-Man was turned to dust, I was like, okay... Yeah, that's not going to stick. All right, whatever. Uh, but I have to say that they turned it around, and the the culmination in Endgame was really well done, really compelling, and uh, I think sort of was a rescue of the whole arc. There were points where I was really down on it, looking at you, Age of Ultron, but hey. other times I hated that movie. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Try it again. Try it again with fresh I eyes. I will, but I think my fresh eyes are going to see the same bullshit. <laughs> Just my a- eyes keep getting older, Morty, but <laughs> the bullshit stays the same age. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Try to get past that first action sequence that looks like shit, and I think the rest of the movie's a little better. There's a lot of nonsense, man. It's like, the first Marvel appearance of Andy Serkis, I think. Just watch for that. But, Okay. I'm not going to... It's too easy for me to fall down the I hate this movie rabbit hole. Yes. But yeah, Dark Fate, uh, Terminator Dark Fate was fantastic. I don't think it met with overwhelming box office success, but I will say that it was fucking refreshing. It was like, imagine a female-led action movie that did not involve them like saving or making babies it didn't involve them having a love interest to the true hero of the of the plot it was just it was like an adult feminist presentation of an action movie and i really fucking appreciated that i was ready i was culturally and academically prepared to handle that. And I, I came through with flying colors. I'd like to congratulate myself. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, would that be your top pick, or did you have a different favorite movie? So I had three movies that I had as notables for 2019. I had Terminator Dark Fate as my overall sort of crowning crowning movie. Um, I did very much like The Furies, which was sort of a quirky art house type horror movie 
that actually had more substance than I was expecting and mm. ended up being pretty cool. Um, uh, let me interject. Speaking of that movie, that reminds me, uh, worthy of mention, I think, is Ready or Not, which is something else you recommended to us. Yeah. Uh, that was really well done and uh, something a little different, something with some interesting elements. Uh, I enjoyed it. There is, you know, there is like a an underrepresented dark comedy horror uh, genre that it doesn't, you don't see all that many releases in that vein. Mm. And Ready or Not definitely had like, it was just like, bad luck to the point that you just got a laugh. Like I didn't it, find it laughingly funny. Like it wasn't to me, it didn't strike me as being like it had comedic dark comedic moments in it, but I don't think I wouldn't call it it wasn't like a Simon Pegg movie. No, you know? it it wasn't that kind of humor. It's right. just like they would they would show you something and you would be like, "Uh-oh." I know exactly what's going to happen with this. Like I see it, I see the I see the key, I see the lock, I see them coming together and there it is. And like when they do it it it's like diffused and the absolute horror of what happened is like tempered by you seeing it coming and like just like wait for it, wait for it, and there it is. You know, you know exactly the part I'm talking about. I'm sure. Not at the With moment. The... Um, no, no. Oh. <laughs> he was gesturing at me, and I, I didn't pick up. Well, on I, it. I tried. I tried to clue with a gesture, but. Well, you mentioned. I hate to be tangent man, but you just mentioned it. something uh, that reminded me that Tom Savini recently on Instagram of the Tom Savini school of makeup and special effects of the Tom Savini who was an amazing makeup artist uh, on many George Romero films and others, yeah. um, posted a Netflix trailer for Lock and Key, which was a oh, great yeah. graphic novel series written by Joe Hill that totally got me into Joe Hill's writing. Um, I would recommend any of Joe Hill's stuff, and if they adapt this series properly, um, and the trailer looks pretty good... It's going to be good. It's going to have some some real interesting stuff, some really dark issues. Like the the trailer makes it look a little bit light to me, and there are some real heavy issues in the book. So I hope they they bring all the complexity to that. I'm excited. I thought that the the lock and key stuff seemed like was really cool, and uh, you know Joe Hill's one of those Joe Hill's funny. Because Joe Hill, I find that his written works are greatly outshined <clears throat> the thea the like cinematic reproductions. Like when I compare Horns, oh yeah. to the movie Horns, no, the book was way better and had like a lot more nuance. And, oh, I yeah. mean, did you did you read Horns or just I see did, the, yeah, like. Oh, spoilers, guys, but it, it came out years ago. They talk about... Um, there's a refrain in the book Horns where mostly they say, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you get what you need. Right. And that's a Rolling Stones quote. But the funny thing that they did was that the whole movie was actually a Rolling Stones reference. It was all sympathy for the devil. The movie they, or the book? Well, the, excuse me, the the book. Yeah, and like it di that did not come through in the movie. The whole like mm -hmm. switch where it distracts you from sympathy of the devil by giving you a different Rolling Stones quote as what you think is your guiding principle, mm -hmm. but then you realize no, it's it really the whole book is sympathy for the devil. The devil doesn't do what he wants to do because he's got these malign things. He does what he has to do because people are shit sometimes and they just want permission to do bad things. Right. But yeah, I, Joe Hill's good. And I hope that Lock and Key is, uh, I hope it's everything it can be. I think it's, it's, it's got a lot of potential and if they, if they do it right, yeah, it'll be, it'll be real good. 
Yeah. So that's exciting. Um, so rolling back, I don't have much more to say about the Furies other than if you like art, artsy horror, the Furies is good. It's deeper than you think it's going to be. There's kind of twists that are interesting. Mm-hmm. A little picture of like snapshot of humanity in whatever element. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't call it arty. It's a pretty solid, like straight up movie. It's not an, an it's not an arty horror movie. It's a straight horror movie. Well, I, I say, say arty just because I I I like the the way it was shot. Okay. Like cinematically or or cinematograph cinematographical <laughs> Yeah. In the pic the look and feel of it had some interesting angles and did things that were kind of interesting. Kinda of, kinda of compelling. And the last thing I was gonna to touch on is uh we know Pedro Pascal of uh Mandalorian which fantastic fucking season ending. Oh, Episode yeah. 8 was so good. Well, the whole thing was... It was, was all great. The but best Star Wars thing yeah, the, in since the 80s. Long time, yeah. yeah. Just the way that started out with the little snapshot of watching two stormtroopers just, like, bullshit with each other and seeing, like, really bad work ethic... <laughs> almost no patience whatsoever very little self-control horrible aim like it really like homed in on all the best things that you've always thought of stormtroopers yeah um but pedro pascal who is like his i feel like his career is on fire right now because he's doing such a such great work in mandalorian mm-hmm. um he had sort of a similar character in a less trafficked movie called Prospect, which is a sci-fi movie about uh, a father-daughter team who go and they're looking to get this one big score on this planet, harvesting uh, some widget. I don't know. It's not really important. They're it's like harvesting. a gem. Yeah, harvesting some kind of crystal something. And, you know, they fall in with these marauders and then, like... What what follows is just an interesting, unlikely team up between the daughter and a marauder, but it's a it's never a full. It's hard to explain, or I shouldn't explain in case you want to watch it. But, it's a it's a complex relationship. But the thing I most I think I even had talked about it back in 2019 was the most compelling thing for me about the movie was the musical selection in it, where mm. they. They took, they were able to project a soundtrack that was far future. And the way they did it was super clever. They took punk bands from India and other regions where the punk influence was so heavily blended with the cultural ethnic uh, influence that it just felt like you were in the future where so many different cultures were blending. So it, it like gave this, like it was just a really compelling soundtrack. And sometimes that's enough to make me really like a movie. Cool. The movie was good overall, but the things they did with the score were fantastic. Yeah. I, I enjoyed that film. And one of the things it evoked for me was, um, The first small collection of H.P. Lovecraft stories I read Mm -hmm. had one in it. uh, It was a collaboration with someone else. Uh, I don't remember the co-author. But I think it was called In the Walls of Eric's. Interesting. And it was about... I think it was set on Venus. Or it was set on another planet. And humans were coming down to like raid some resources they were finding there. And there was some big deposit they had detected, and they're going after this deposit. And the native life, I think, was, like, vegetable. Um, but they were, like, sort of... And forgive me, my recollection of this might not be quite right, but they were, like, some sort of man-like uh, plant people. Okay. And they were going for this deposit, and they hit this, like, invisible wall. They're like, what the fuck? And they couldn't figure it out, but, you know, the greed pushed them on, so they found this opening and they went in. 
they're in this invisible labyrinth and they're trying to get to this thing to to raid the resources and they get stuck in there they can't get out you know it's like it's like journal you know hp lovecraft doing yeah. journal entry kind of things and all these creatures are like gathering around to watch to watch them try to get out and get stuck and die and it kind of gave me that feeling with that that sort of alien world with sort of the not primitive but very relaxed sort of spacesuits and just the feeling of that planet um that prospect was set on it just that's really what that reminded me of i thought it was interesting that's pretty cool yeah and hmm. similar you know going for the resources the weird plant life thing yeah well neat well i i suggest that a, acquire a viewing somehow and per, probably i'm sure you can do it i have yeah. faith in you guys it's it's, <laughs> you know, it's worth checking. I don't out. know if it's on Netflix or maybe iTunes. Mo- is iTunes movies a thing? Is that a iTunes? Thing? Yeah, rents stuff and yeah, whatnot. So Amazon you can work it out somewhere. we I feel like maybe it's time to to refresh our beverage. Yeah, let's go for uh, the second cup. Okay, second right. of two. Let's do it. All right, so we have our ah, second cups refreshed with a second cup. Fire is shockingly still burning. Fire's got it going. No, it's it was touch and go in the beginning. Uh, I tried to rush the fire making in the in its, its early stages, but it it's it's okay now. It it looks mature. Mm. What are you drinking there? What do you got? So I have to say, I found this recipe. I found it hard to believe, but I think it is the sleeper hit of the season. Um. After looking up absinthe eggnog cocktails, I, of course, had to look for a chartreuse eggnog cocktail, and I did not find that. But what I did fi- find was a mixture of chartreuse and hot chocolate called, in French, the vert chaud, the hot green, which, shockingly, is quite amazing. It is simply two ounces of green chartreuse, with six ounces of hot chocolate with some whipped cream on top if you want damn i it's shocking how well this works together is all i can say i would i didn't see it coming but it is delicious it is uh i would i would dare say with a no stakes guarantee like if it if you don't like it i have no liability but i still would guarantee that if you tried this you will like it will be your winter jam this is, yeah, this is uh, the ill-advised journey to, which will be undertaken next month yeah. to the cold wastes of Montreal. Back to the cold. Um, I think this is going to be, this is, this is going to help us get through that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm actually hoping for bad weather once we're up there. <laughs> snowed you in sick with, freak. Snowed in with a good supply of this? Yeah, that's true. We're all set. Yeah. Yeah. DJ controller. Boombox. Oh, yeah. DJ controller. I think I'll bring a video projector next time so we can, you know, have some some movies if that's what makes sense. That'd be fun. Um, Yeah, but uh, speaking of not movies, I'm thinking back to the games that have come out in 2019 and what I've enjoyed. Yeah. You know, there's been some good games. I, I enjoy Detroit Become Human. Yeah, for sure. Um, But I feel like there's like an amnesia effect because Borderlands 3 is so damn good. Yeah, I didn't play anything this year like I voraciously uh, played Borderlands. Um, I will say if uh, God of War was this year, God of War was damn good. I don't think you played that. I've seen you play it. Really well done. Uh, No bugs that I found. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's pretty rare. Um, Damn good story. Damn good design. The whole thing was was very well done. But Borderlands, for a pure fun factor, just takes it up so many notches. To be fair, I have to say, when you mention no bugs, I would... I cannot... I cannot qualify that Borderlands 3 is without bugs. Yeah. It had, like, they would make an update and it would break some stuff and fix some stuff. But 
they kept at it, and if if it broke some stuff, it would break something not as bad as what they fixed. So usually, yes, <laughs> yeah, like there was there were some minor quirks where you couldn't mark items for for trashing. Yeah, and like it was little Silly stuff. Things. But far outstripping that was their effort, where they just released DLC that was not part of season pass stuff. It was just free for the holidays for everyone who was playing. Yeah, and it was not a phone in thing. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't expansive, but it was thematically really complete. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's really nice when you see the developers are that uh invested and in, in, you know involved in it um i'll also say i think control came out in 2019 and control is really really quite good um it's not as outright fun and it's hard to talk about it uh without spoiling things mm. it has a very it's one of those games where you have to figure out what the hell is going on, so it's it's hard to it's hard to talk about the plot, but the gameplay mechanics are are very interesting. Uh, the atmospherics are great, and it's different, and that's what um, that's what I really like about it. So that's up there too. But I think overall, Borderlands would have to be my pick as well. Now, as far as your play style for Borderlands, did you, like, I found the end of the game, like, for me, the end of the game was, like, almost anticlimactically easy, because along the way, I'm the kind of gamer that if I get a side quest, I complete the side quest before moving on with the main quest. Right. And I seek out every side quest. So being at maximum level going into that last fight, it was somewhat trivial. I think they expected it to be approachable at ten levels under where I was. Yeah, like if you don't, if you're not a completist and you get there, you know, without as much progression, it still was supposed to be beatable. And I think, I think that's a good design decision. But if you found like, you know, the Malawan. Circle, you know, the Slaughterhouse Three Thousand or whatever, Slaughter Star Three Thousand. Mm-hmm. You know, where you're, where you're stuck in the arena and you're, you know, that is really challenging, com- especially compared to the end of the game. So, yeah, yeah. If you, if, I see what you're saying. There's a couple things that are much, yeah, exactly. The assault on the Maliwan Black Site is, I'm miserable. Like, yeah. I'm just horrible at that. I can't get past the Valkyries, but I haven't tried. I haven't even gotten in the building. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I, like, hang out, and there's all these orbs and ratches and stuff, and they're all, like, it's a pain in the butt, and they destroy me, and I'm like, ah, forget it. Well, you know, we got to combine our efforts on that one. That's true. It's true. Together we can get through. (laughs) Together we can get to the bosses and die there. Yep, that's true. <laughs> that's also true. Um, Man, my wife gets pissed when that happens. <laughs> yeah. Well. But anyway. Um, so we can stay on media, and I there's a couple recent additions that I don't even know. Yeah, we know Witcher. Witcher was a 2019. That was December something. Yeah, December 12th or something. I feel like Dracula was in early 2020. I couldn't get past the trailers on that one. That looks like a piece of shit. The first episode's good. I've heard that it falls off. The whole premise is that it's sort of like Dracula meets Sherlock Holmes, sort of, except Sherlock Holmes is played by a female descendant of the Van Helsings, and she is analyzing what rules apply to dracula like how dracula works and deriving what dracula's weaknesses are based on things that she observes and the first episode's cool but i've heard actually pretty scary Hmm. but i've heard that it falls off a bit yeah i I don't know that one just didn't look appealing yeah i don't know did you in fact toss a coin to your witcher 
Uh, I watched the series and enjoyed it. Yeah, um, they're a lot. They did a lot of things very similar uh, to the source material, so that was good to see. Um, I have high hopes that they'll renew it and it'll keep going and they'll cover a lot. I mean, there's like nine books, so there's a lot of material to cover. I'm pretty positive they're going to renew it. Yeah, they like better. It, it really has had a lot of widespread acceptance. Yeah. Um, There's so many bad remixes and covers of that song. The memes, yeah, <laughs> it's it's really out of control. Well, nothing beats Baby Yoda when it comes to meme volume. Oh my god, yes. But, uh, yeah. Peak meme. <laughs> so true. Well, you saw the crossover of Baby Yoda plus Witcher? No, I don't think so. Baby Yoda's fucking around in, in uh, the cockpit. And he keeps turning on the video for toss a coin to your Witcher. Oh, I did see and that. And the Mandalorian yeah. turns it off. He's like, "Stop <laughs> it, <laughs> stop it." Um, you know, I've I think I'm gonna I'm gonna say something controversial here. Witcher is not great. I'm not saying I don't love it, but it's I, not. I very... recognize its shortcomings. I'm like, yeah. okay. Yennefer is written all over the fucking place, and sometimes you hate her, sometimes you're sympathetic, sometimes you're just like, you can't get a real feel for, for like, how do I feel about this person? Yes. Like, she's, she's upset because she can't have babies and says that choice was taken from her, but clearly, two episodes ago, she was like, yes, yeah, sign me up, I'm good with it. So, there's a lot that's like... I don't know. I, I uh, her character is problematic enough that I understand the criticism of like it's not great, but at the same time, it's great in other ways. That's pretty. That are pretty compelling. I think uh, the fact that the chronology is all mixed up, which is how the first collection of of stories are, doesn't help. The series, um, I think it throws an element of confusion into it that I don't know if it's really beneficial. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we do, you do catch on. I think I really was like, oh, this is really not chronological when I got to episode four and the mm -hmm. queen was back alive and doing stuff. And right. that was like the real, like, oh, okay. So they're telling the story very much out of order. Right, which doesn't to, it doesn't really help trying to understand the characters when, you know, there's episodes that are 30 years removed from each other and it's like, what? Yeah. yeah. I, you know, it's it's one of those things where my uh my partner when they write off a series, it's very hard for me to find time to fit it in, so I'm like stuck at episode I think there's eight, right? Yes. I think I'm stuck at episode six of eight, and I can't get further because every time I put it on, there's it's subject to critique from the audience, and it's just, I can't handle it. <laughs> it wears you down. Yeah, I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it, it kind of sucks, but I still kind of want to watch it. But... It's worth it. It's worth it to get to the end. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that... What is his name? Geralt. No, what is the actor's name? Oh, Henry Cavill? Henry Cavill is a pretty good Geralt. Shockingly, I... I Yeah, I I didn't have high hopes. I'm so used to the, the voice acting from the game, um, which is corny but perfect in a way. I, I don't know. I think he's doing a lot better than a lot of people expected. I think... Uh He's very good at the, 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 hmm. Yeah. Followed by like a pause and then just says fuck. Like that happens <laughs> you, all you the time. You mentioned, yeah. But that's like, that, I think that's pretty perfect because everyone's life is like that. Mm hmm. Hmm. Fuck. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty close to the book. So Ooh. I appreciate that. Now, did you dabble with, uh, Lost in Space 2? No. The first season...
did not compel me to try the second season at all. The first season, I forgot that the first season had like seriously problematic elements. <laughs> like you, it's a family, a genius family in space that somehow always chooses the perfectly wrong thing to do. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. It's well, all awesome father, space. Father's yeah. dead, right? No, he's cool. He's fine. Oh, I thought he got he's eaten good. by those eels or something. No, nah, he's good. Or buried alive. He's or... fine. He got this. All right. <laughs> yeah, he's good. I can't no, remember. No, he really is good. I really thought he died. No. The space marine soldier guy that yeah. was never home? Yeah, he's fine. All right. They're bringing this family together, okay? I don't know. <laughs> family values tour, okay? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what was that corn that had the family values tour uh, back in M&M. the 90s? Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. I think. No, I could be wrong. Maybe. I one of the, They both had something very similar, I'm sure. I did not attend it, whoever it was. Yeah. Oh, there was uh... a... <sighs> Anything else from 2019? Well... There is the sort of like oh, cultural, yeah, retrospect. Yeah. I, I'd like to congratulate you on uh, the successful launch of an event series, right? Isn't Catharsis a 2019 baby? I think it was. You know, it's it's not really my baby, but um, very, I think it is. I'm proud and happy to be a part of it. I think, like, as one half of the official uh, resident DJ roster. I consider it your baby, and I know for sure I call it your baby because you're a significant draw for the event. Cool. Well, so, yeah, I, I have a good time, and uh, I think it's fun. It's a little something different, different atmosphere, so, yeah. If people happen to be listening to this before January 24th? Okay, good. I'm glad you knew, because <laughs> I was like 22nd. Yeah. Later in January, like uh, let me triple check. Okay, triple check it. But if you're hearing this before, you know there's there's an opportunity for you to come out to hang around the Hudson and check out Catharsis, which is, you know, it's 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 further testimony that goth industrial post punk whatever you want to call it counterculture is actually really really healthy, not only in upstate New York. But it's like it's spreading. Like the the DJs who are around here, I know DJ Tetchy has had like surrounding gigs at other other areas. DJ yeah. K Spec has been out in other areas, and it's like it's really neat that what is coming from Albany is sort of leaking into the entire Northeast in a in a really cool way. Yeah, it's it's really it's pretty exciting because. It just wasn't this way, you know, five, ten years ago. Like, yeah. Like, it's really, it's, it's really been growing, and I think that has a lot to do with the, some of, some of the fostering you did of the community, and having guest DJs, and being more welcoming, and trying to show people the ropes, in a way. Well, I think it's one of those things where it can sound like a, it can sound insincere because it's so simply stated but goth really is for everyone Mm -hmm. like it's not there there used to be this thing with this elitist exclusion from like you had to you must be this cool to ride this ride right but like albany has always like just tossed that right out the window not always not not, i should say (laughs) this wave albany yeah going back 10 years like right that's when it kind of started where it's like i want to i want to show the quote-unquote normals that they're not really as normal as they thought they were and they like the freak they like freaky shit too (laughs) yeah it's uh it's really it's really interesting so there's three pretty regular i'll call them regular they're not super catharsis isn't is still kind of looking for a regular cadence. I think we're, we've just about got it. But, th- I mean, the area is supporting three regular nights. So I think that's pretty extraordinary in and of itself. And they each have something that's really unique, too. Oh, yeah. There's a different a different emphasis, yeah. you know, from each one. 
Um, and the one of the things that I most appreciate is the people who work to put on one of them can actually just enjoy themselves at another one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a very open and no one's trying to be super competitive. You know, we're, we're all trying to stay out of each other's ways, really. And everybody knows one another. Yeah. It's, it's not a big, it's not a big thing. So. Yeah, Catharsis uh, coming back to Hangar on the Hudson, January 24th, Friday. So uh, starting at 9 p.m., uh, come out and check us out. Cool, cool. Uh. <clears throat> X Humanity just had a its seventh, eighth annual. Yeah, the eighth Meow House event. Yeah. It's a tough one. I'm going I'm, I'm to give it to you straight. Meow House is like the best and the worst. <laughs> Well, it's the worst for you because you, you have all that prep to do. It's not even the prep. It's it's an event that like historic. I'll, I'll, like you, you already know how sausage is made, but the like the workings were January is the hardest month to drive attendance to because if you're doing an event the first Friday of January, there's a very high likelihood that New Year's Eve happened like a couple of days ago and everyone yeah. partied and is ruined has it ever been on the first i can't remember it might have been one time maybe not you know i'm i don't think it has okay. i think i would have remarked if it was actually no it couldn't because then it would be the 31st is new year's eve when people observe oh it, yeah so i don't think it's ever come up on the first maybe it has I'm not sure. <laughs> it's never been New Year's Eve, that's for damn sure. Oh, well, yeah, no, no. Um, but it may have been the first in the past. <clears throat> okay. Um, but, you know, so when you have an event that you know is going to be poorly attended, you can either just phone it in and do a low-key event, or you can do uh, do something that is compelling for a charity... Because either way, you're not going to make money. So making it the charity month has, like, it started out slow. I think the first month was like $700 that it made for for Whiskers, which is our chosen charity. Still not bad. And that's not bad. Yeah. But since then, every year it has grown through, like, new innovations in how to compel people to give more and more donation. Really getting, like, the artistic community to help with with auction items and stuff this year the eighth meow house was a five thousand dollar donation to whiskers which that is incredibly helpful like especially when january is when all of the donations dry up because december everyone took yeah. the tax write-offs yeah giving tuesday and all that nonsense yeah. so i mean that's really spectacular and you know, I was there because DJ Tachi, yeah. uh, my wife was performing, and I wanted to get out and try to see people. And man, that place was packed. That's, that's the bad part, oh. is so many people come out. And the I'm going to say it was at venue capacity. Oh, yeah. That's not exactly the truth, because I wasn't counting very well, but... <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was at least at venue. Well, no, we're going to just say it was at venue capacity. Um, but it was it was super packed. And as a photographer, that posed a lot of difficulty because I, I didn't have any space between me and the photo subject. So it made it, like, impossible for me to photograph things. Yeah, super so, awkward. And, yeah. yeah, like, I mean, I'm, I got a bunch of photos, and a, they were cool to look through in retrospect, but the amount of people who not only came out looking great, but came out, like, thematically great, like our friend Emily, you're friends with Emily, the I don't artist. Really, I don't really know her, no. Oh, well, she came out with I know of her. The most adorable, like, tough cat. It was, like, kind of like a tough alley cat, like, <laughs> looking like <laughs> trouble. It was so good. And then, you know, there was, like, more elegant 
cats and like just all kinds and there were like a whole menagerie there was rabbits there was wolves there was like everything yeah. Yeah. and it's just like a crazy animal house that was pretty <laughs> great yeah uh but yeah that that went well um and tetchy i feel like tetchy is now like sentenced to a lifelong recurring meow house appearance it's got to happen every year from now on like, i don't think she thing. minds yeah okay that's good that was uh i believe that was her debut at like Meow house three or four was it it might have been yeah fantastic is that when tko started to be a thing was, i think tko was slightly thereafter i think tetchy <laughs> did it on her own once and then then the group kind of formed a super group yeah for sure tko have yeah. we talked about tko I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. So DJ Tetchy, uh, DJ Omega Telic, and DJ K Spec. Yeah. Uh, three prominent lady sort of, DJs. Yeah, sort of the second generation, like uh, Macno, myself, a few other ones, and DJ Recluse were the like kind of the first main crew. Yeah, and then Tetchy and Omega Telic and Salvage and, and yeah, and, yeah, you know the other guys started coming up and yeah, taking over. Bless them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I remember the realization. I think there was like there was both a Powerpuff Girls thing mm -hmm. as well as a Mortal Kombat thing because there are <laughs> there are female Mortal Kombat that do the green the blue and the the pink yeah i can't remember there's so many mortal kombat characters is that oh boy it's you know, know you them. know you you're gonna know more than me so like oh, if I I, I I think it was melina is blue katana is green and i don't remember who the pink one is i don't know but yeah it's a thing not necessarily scarlet pink. could also be red Pink, red, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. We're talking about brightness, not hue, so it's in the right yeah, it's in the right category ish. All right. Ish. Um But what was your what would you now I did stuff and I had a yeah, I think really it was only around Halloween that I kind of found myself with a lot of bookings, both DJ and uh, photographic okay but i didn't actually make it to many like major events that i wasn't involved with somehow uh, i'm gonna say that i'm really looking forward to 2020's dark side of the con yeah um i imagine dark side of the con 2019 was one of the one of like the 10 post events of goth community for for that year i mean i, I thought it was really cool um the the uh the venue the the hotel it was at is is really um has kind of a unique architecture it looks a little like a castle and you know stabbing westward um was going to play there and as a surprise for my wife who's uh very much a fan they were selling tickets to a more intimate uh, it was billed as an acoustic show. That wasn't quite accurate. But it was like an extra little surprise. So I got tickets to that, and that ended up being super cool. And um, the whole thing was just really good. The vendors were spectacular. So many bands. Uh, I didn't get to see all the bands I wanted to see because there was kind of so much going on. And we had a few people, a few friends from the area who also went. So... You know, we had uh, some hangout time, and yeah, it was it was it was a nice time, and it's a small enough place that you can just retreat back to your room without too much trouble and head back down. Well, I'm excited, my ow, fuck, foot cramp. Yeah, <laughs> um, my first dark side is going to be this one. Um, I'm pretty excited. I, I, it's a funny thing. I know that as lineup was being announced it was interesting but for me it's it's really i like the con element more than the concert element mm. so 
I just just being in that wash of people with the cultural understanding of where I'm coming from is is exciting because usually like I'm totally the weirdo and it's like I could you know I I say you know Switchblade Symphony and nobody knows what the fuck I'm talking about you know, like it's just yeah but you know it, it's good to be amongst our peeps yeah I know it, it should be really good um you know Brian's going to be there, and a lot of people, a lot of our friends are going, so it'll be another. Yeah, uh, Abby Death is going to be there. Yeah, I plan on taking the yoga session with uh, Valerie Abby. Right, right. The hungover, yeah. hungover yoga, <laughs> something. <clears throat> now, uh, I meant to bring that up earlier. So we're in the the upper the upper floor here. How many goth acts have have? Uh, stayed over here oh my gosh from playing you know ex-humans or a lot like abby death brian abby death, the the <laughs> the the gothicals have been here um there were ones that i feel like i kind of copped out on and did not let stay over oh well there are certain bands that, like, you don't know them and they make you nervous when you're booking them. <laughs> and it makes you say, like, I'm sure they're going to put on a great show. I know they can make music, but they may also rob me. Fair enough. And so, like, some bands didn't didn't stay over, but uh, I'm trying to think. There's, a lot of people have stayed up here. And it's more hospitable now than it ever has been now with the the guest amenities of the, the snack locker and the, <laughs> the guest refrigerator. Yes, it's very nice additions. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you can really spend a weekend just in the attic if you didn't have to go to the bathroom. Well, you can pee out the window, I suppose. You gotta. <laughs> You're gonna have to. <laughs> the neighbors can handle it, maybe. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so, uh, a well-storied history yeah. in, the, in the room we're in. It's got goth power. We actually have framed notes written on, uh, paper towels that different bands have left as like, thank you so much for your hospitality. We, we bought the Gothicals pajamas and they were like, <laughs> that get like later notes, like months later, like. I'm I'm in the supermarket listening to the audiobook you gave me, wearing the pajamas that you gave me, <laughs> and I'm just thinking, this is a really mechno weekend. <laughs> nice. I'm like, all right. That's really satisfying. That's great. My legacy lives on in, in their lifestyle. You've done a lot to spread the legacy of oh my God. Albany got well, seen, so Well, I think it's just it's such a weird it's a weird community that wants a culture and so something that's like a culture that is as tenacious as goth industrial that's like used to being shit on constantly it's a good match it's a good fit it's gonna make it work <laughs> very nice there was the first uh, in a controversial news there was the first uh venue complaint against the patrons of of uh X-Human slash X-Humanity. Really? At the, yeah, from maybe the, I shouldn't spill this tea, but... It's, from Meow House? No, it was, be, it was before Meow House, but a very impassioned vegan actually carved on a freshly painted wall. Didn't, didn't paint, there didn't a uh, marker or sticker. They carved into the wall like a paragraph about how being vegan is a good choice and that like murder has no place in sustainability or something. I can't remember exactly what the message was. The message is like kind of not the important part of this. It was that somebody felt so impassioned that they actually carved it into gypsum. Yeah. And gypsum board. So like, I don't know. It's kind of annoying. I I actually kind of think it was a not regular who was not sober and sounds like it not well behaved, but, uh, I'm sure it's already been patched. Otherwise I'm, I'm tempted to, to head over there and 
bring some spackle and, and make it right and give a, a fatherly stern talking to the to the group and like, hey, if you see someone kick that fucker in the back of the leg because there's no there's no there's really no reason to do that shit. Come on. Well, it's not your baby anymore though. Right. I still care, but it's I not my care. baby. I'll have to let someone else uh, instigate a leg kicking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what do you have uh planned for for this year besides uh Dark Side of the Con? Um, well, Anything exciting? I am very much looking forward to the Expedition North for an advisable journey, too. Yep, yep, yep. Um, we're just about almost to the point where planning can start. Now, like, planning has already started. I know where the, the base camp is, and, and uh, you know, there's certain established options for where to get poutine and where to get brunch and stuff even though that brunch place was like crazy busy yeah i would i would i would explore other brunch options maybe well i think that's good too i think that (laughs) there's so many good options in montreal that dude we gotta go back to that falafel place that place was amazing oh my Bustan? god what was it called i don't remember. yeah boost on yeah like, something like that for just a kind of generic like it was the popeyes of falafel or whatever so good but it was amazingly good yeah um but as far as like planning cultural opportunities like are there club nights happening are there concerts happening you can't it's like they don't start publicizing it months in advance it's like a good month in advance is when maybe you'll start to catch wind of what's happening Hmm. so i gotta start i think probably uh 15th of january i'll start really paying attention to goings on in montreal to find like what's what's happening all right hopefully we'll keep our shit together this time and be able to get out to a club night that would be fun that wasn't even on us though i mean it was but we didn't do anything wrong. It was just you got to have so much sleep and you got to yeah. like it gets to you to be doing that much stuff over that few shorter days. Yeah, we were doing a lot of walking in the freezing cold and Yeah, but we know a lot more now. That's we true. We know exactly where to where to get the booze that we need that like <laughs> it's not that far if you know exactly where you're going and there's a pretty good selection. We know where the supermarket is. We 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 got this this time. Yes. Unlock. Uh Yeah, maybe maybe I can uh yeah, there's there's plenty of options. It would be cool to see if we can hook up with the TST Montreal chapter, the temp, the, the oh. Satanic Temple. Okay. I'm sure they would have something if they have something going, it would be cool to sit on a meeting if it isn't all in French. It would be cool otherwise, but you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be great. Uh, later in 2019, I have my annual trip to... 2020? Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> oh, geez. Let me have another sip of this. Nope, it's just silt. Um, <laughs> the 2020 trip to San Diego oh. uh, should be coming up in March. Uh, it's sort of a mixed thing. I go for work and... Because I have a hotel room, my my workplace is generous enough that they don't mind if I bring uh, Chimera with me. So they get like a full vacation like kind of experience where they do whatever they feel like during the day, and you know usually they camp out a they pick a nice coffee shop where they just set up and become a regular for a week, and uh, they were actually really. Uh, Sad to see them go at the end of the tenure. It's like every day they would go over to Skyloft Coffee and hang out and sketch and drink coffee and have sandwiches and stuff. And at the end of the week, they're like, will we ever see you again? No. And they're like, maybe next year. That's sweet. Yeah. So, and by night, oh my gosh, I wish wish you had an occasion to go to San Diego because... One of these days. There is a bar called Bar Kindred, and I think I've gone on about it quite a bit, but it's a vegan bar. Everything is vegan there, and they don't, I don't think anything 
publicizes vegan. Mm. It's just like what they do stands completely on its own and it's it happens to be vegan but their priority is that everything is like absolutely delicious and and amazing so definitely gonna have a night when we go to to kindred um and i as far as i know i haven't gotten my work plane ticket there yet but as far as i know that's like kind of an important thing to attend to just see what my industry is like there's a the OFC, the Optical Fiber Conference, um, is out there, and I I do like networking equipment, so I need to I need to know what people are are forecasting to be the big deal over the next year, and what the industry is really going to push. Gotcha. So, so yeah, that's that's those are the oh my god, the San Diego Goth Nights are absurd. In a good way? Not so much. Oh. But to be fair, I like went out on a Thursday night yeah. and I had to enter like you enter through the back door of a strip club and they like let the back room be like kind of 80s goth sort of that was weird and attended by like five people included the pe- including the people who were who were like putting it on. Yeah. So like it it wasn't I'm not meaning to shit on it. It was just very different and I would have kind of expected San Diego to be a lot more vibrant, but I think I just went maybe to a lesser attended thing accidentally. Maybe. A better publicized lesser attended. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, more research have, maybe. Find yeah. find the good stuff. Yeah. How about you? What's uh what's your 2020 got? Well, um, we have, a uh, every other year we try to do, we, we do like a small vacation and then we alternate with a bigger vacation. Mm-hmm. So coming up this year, my wife really wanted to go to Harry Potter world Ooh. at, uh, Universal Studios Orlando. Very cool. So we're going down there and we're going to spend a good five days at the parks and, uh, do everything we can do. That's cool. That's going to be really fun. So yeah, that should be cool. Yeah. I have a friend who works there, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very nice. I think she works in uh, Ollivander's Wand Shop. Or oh, whatever sweet. Or whatever that is. Yeah, so. Okay. I'll, uh, Very cool. I'll see if I can connect you guys, get the get the right wand hookup. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, I have uh, some new music I'm working on. So oh, there should exciting. Be, there should be a Velocity release, you know, in a couple months, hopefully. Um, going to get some some good uh some good guests on there got eric busta is going to be hopefully doing some drumming and awesome might have some from stoker s- yep yeah. might have some new people show up the stoker record is going to come out one of these days oh my god very exciting we're yeah. looking to do a release party allegedly perhaps in may okay cool, cool uh so that'll be fun and uh kieran asked me to uh dj uh for some of that release party so that oh, should be very fun cool I'll get to play some different stuff, maybe some, you know, some of the more uh, rocky, you know, 80s, 90s, indie rock, post-punk, punk, nice. whatever. Fugazi. Probably whatever the hell I want. I don't know. I haven't yeah. asked, I haven't talked to him yet, but yeah, probably whatever. So that'll be fun, a little bit different. And uh, beyond that, I'm not sure. Um that's all I have my sights set on right now. Obviously, Dark Side of the Con 4. That'll also be a good time. And, uh, yeah, fun stuff. Um, I know that we're going to host a Halloween party. Oh, yeah. But even beyond that, I think that 2020 is going to have the first x Oh, I don't want to diffuse it by saying that we're going to do it in 2020. But having attended a fetish ball in Massachusetts, mm. I'm inspired that an event can be a, a worthwhile success without being complete perfection. Right. So yeah. I think I'm, I'm searching for a venue for that sort of uh, cultural fringe to, to put something on. Cool. It was interesting. It was, you know... Honestly, it was it was not that 
it was kind of like a little bit sexier themed goth night with I don't know, it just wasn't that different. It okay. it was it was cool mm-hmm. and people were definitely felt licensed to dress more expressively than they would have otherwise, but it was nothing that was like shocking. It was not like I don't know. I think if you see like things like movie depictions of this shit with like eyes wide shut or like some something where you imagine it's going to be much crazy, like really crazy, it's not because as soon as someone gets really crazy, they get really thrown out. <laughs> like <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's not happening. We don't need this kind of we don't need this bullshit. You got to go. Fair, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's cool. That's yeah. that'll be something different for the area. Yeah, I just got to find a you know maybe the the ancient order of the royal Hiberians or something. <laughs> got to find the right the right venue, appropriate venue like that. Yeah, yeah, just like that. Yeah. Maybe the VFW Hall on Delaware. Oh, perfect. Well, actually, the one I was at was at a VFW, <laughs> and it felt like it. There was oh. like there was it was unf- you know it was a good event. But there was a very high school dance feeling to it because right. of where it was held. And okay. like maybe it was just the really tall ceilings. I I don't know what it was, but it was like it was an aesthetic battle to make that place something other than uh, what it was. Veterans Hall, yeah. Yeah. So like yeah, I guess uh finding the right venue is uh the hardest part. Okay. Cool. I hear a ruckus. There is a ruckus. Someone's bringing it outside. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Well. Thanks, neighbors. I have to say, um, between our last podcast, which was probably late November, we Mm -hmm. totally skipped December because things got crazy. It does. Um, There's been a lot of new music that that has been happening and that I've been uh, kind of into to varying degrees. Did you have anything that's uh, of note lately that you wanted to talk about? Um, You've been busy, too. You know, I, I, I keep getting... You know, here's... When I'm not actively researching new music, I tend to fall into the trap of listening to audiobooks. Mm. And so my it's like I'll either be actively, aggressively researching new music, listening to everything new that has come out, or just ignoring it all, listening to audiobooks and just catching some stuff on the side from from stuff I know. So I'm I'm definitely would be personally appreciative if you could share some some recent releases that are good. Well, uh, a couple things um, on Negative Gain, uh, Twin Tribes released a, an album called Ceremony. Uh, Twin Tribes, you know, pretty good. I kind of like their style. They're kind of a little retro, you know, post, post-punk, you know, early kind of goth sounds. Um, almost uh, a little bit of a curish kind of thing going on in some of the guitar tones and melody. Um, pretty cool. Uh, Caroline Blind from Sunshine Blind has been doing some solo releases. I think there's only two singles out so far. Um, Need to Say, I think, is the latest one. Uh, it's just a single. I think that one's an original. The other one, I think, is a, a cover of a, like a swan song. Um, I've always liked her voice. Uh, I'm excited to hear what else is going to be coming out from her. I think she has a couple things lined up. That's I don't know if it's leading up to an album or if it's just going to be a couple singles. Um, but she's been doing some touring recently. I'd love to see her up in this area, but I think she's mostly West Coast now. Yeah. Um, Sunshine Blind played up here a couple times in the 90s. They were just fucking phenomenal live. Like, changed my whole way I thought about live acts. It was so good. Um, Daniel Belasco's other uh, project other than Glass Apple Bonsai, um, the newer one called uh, The Necromancer's Union, put out a second, I think it's an EP, it's called Shadows. Uh, I can't remember how many songs, I think it's only four or five songs. But also pretty good stuff, a little retro, kind of a earlier sort of goth style, um, but like newer production, you know, really well done. 
uh, pretty cool songs. Uh, big one for me, uh, a band called Wingtips um, put out a, a record called Exposure Therapy. I think this one might have also been on Negative Gain. Um, I think I had told you about Wingtips. Maybe. Yeah, they they were they feel kind of curish to me. Definitely. And I dig them. I, yeah. I dig them quite a bit. Pretty cool stuff. Um, I definitely get the Cure feeling in some of the guitar tones and maybe a little bit of the vocal style. But they do some different things with uh, some different rhythms, some different drum things. And uh, pretty good record. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm digging that one quite a bit. Um, another act you turned me on to, uh, Marva Von Theo, has a new mm. uh, single out called Embrace the, This Madness. Uh, I wasn't sure on that song. I had to listen to it a couple times, but it, it got me. It got me. I had to. I had to have it. Um, pretty good stuff. Good production and a really good voice. Like I'm impressed with her singing. Yeah, I was impressed. Yeah, Marva Von Theo. Uh, good stuff. And another band you turned me on to. Oh shit, Seraphim System. <laughs> okay. Not my normal jam. Tell me you heard the. The, uh, what, what is it? Oh, it was Excessive Farce or something? Tell, go on. I don't remember that one. But, uh, they had, they had some, uh, some genre, uh, they had participated in creating, like, Agro Saw, or, I can't remember the name of it. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me for butchering that. But the release before that, I actually really liked, like, super hard industrial sort of techno, super distorted sounds, very dance-focused, but they changed it up enough that it kept it interesting. Like, a lot of that music is just too heavy, aggressive, and monotonous for me, but uh, their production is so good, and and they, they kept it moving so well that I really dug it. And I get a similar feeling from the latest release, which is called Mutant Motherfucker 3. And Motherfucker is kind of uh, abbreviated M-T-H-R-F-K-R. <laughs> okay. So there's no vowels. Um, pretty good stuff. If you like the heavier, um, more of, I would say, what X-Humanity has kind of evolved into playing these days. Mm-hmm. Like sort of almost a just really heavy almost like a witch doctor yeah uh type type aesthetic um that's what they're about and a very well produced uh, like dance tracks uh the night sickles are back with the print and color ep so that is uh goth sickles plus night something that's the question. I I'm knew it sorry. was Gothicals and something, but I couldn't remember. But wait, back up for one second. Sure. So Seraphim Systems released a recently released a compilation of their pre Death Watch a- Death Watch Asia uh, tracks. Swagrotech was the word I was trying to think. Swagrotech, of. nice. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but uh, that's what I meant. Yeah, no, that's correct. I didn't love the Swagger Tech release. It was the one um, before that I preferred. This this uh, this uh, this is kind of a combination of three albums called System Initializing, and one of the things they included was the Deadly. I think it's called Deadly Farce CD, which was an industrial comedy CD where it was released to thwart piracy. And it was like they had their de- deadly force and they had deadly deadly farce. And it was meant to muddy the water and make it confusing for pirates. But the deadly farce is actually fantastic. It will like just be like a, a couple, like a few seconds of industrial and then will drop to like NWA, fuck the police. And you're just like, what? Or like, troll a little low. Or, or like, <laughs> just so many hilarious things. That so it's kind of mixtape like- It's kind of mixtape And there's industrial stuff and, like, weird outtakes. It It's definitely worth hearing. It's very funny. Cool. Um, so Nightsicles, right. Yeah, the Nightsicles. Uh, the music is done by the act... 
the non Gropner Act, uh, who I think are actually based in Sweden or Finland. I'm oh. sorry, I'm foggy on the details on this. And then Brian does the vocals. So if you if you need your goth sickles fix, uh, check out the night sickles. It has the same whacked out energy that you expect, and it's called the Print and Color EP. Nice. Uh, Witch Doctor released an excellent single called Oracle. Oracle, yeah. That is a banging fire. club jam. Ed, bless him. <laughs> yeah. It's good. It's good stuff. And he's a really good contractor. Yeah? He could fix a fucking bathroom like nobody's business. So I've Damn. Been, I've been trying to bribe him to come and, <laughs> like, DJ and fix the bathroom at the same time. <laughs> Your bathroom or the feed yeah, box this, bathroom? this bathroom. My bathroom. <laughs> okay. In, in Mechnopolis. Just, like, <laughs> pull out the whole bathtub, reframe the walls, do all that shit, and, like... While keeping the beats flowing, I, want, I think you could do it. What's his rate for that? <sighs> That's going to cost you. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I'm not sure. We're in negotiation, but I'm sure that's costly. He's going to need a professional visa for that shit. Outlaw. <laughs> He's going to do it outside the law. <laughs> All right, I'm almost done. I got a All few right. more. So here's a uh, an older release that I put on my wish list like months and months ago, mm-hmm. and then I finally got the funds to like check it out and like see if I really wanted it. So the band is called Bedless Bones, hmm. and the release is called Sublime Malaise. This sounds familiar. I'm gonna see if I have this myself. It's pretty cool. It's sort of um, it's hard to describe. It's not super heavy hitting. It's not super club boom boom. But it's modern, gothy, well-produced stuff. Uh, it's hard for me to get more specific than that. Um, I really liked it. It's It's got a modern edge to it, um, but it has a lot of beauty to it. Uh, I, I, I dug it. Um, another band who's been around a little while that I just got into called Rose Garden Funeral Party. Uh, I think one of the latest releases is called Martyr. I really liked it. I liked the aesthetic. I think they're out of Texas. Um, I haven't super absorbed it yet, so I can't comment too heavily. It's been a couple weeks since I listened to it. I apologize, but good stuff. And they have uh, some older releases as well. Um, uh, Female vocals, um, sort of a very strident... A uh, voice that really cuts through. Um, not really. I can't really compare it to any other vocalist. Not like Susie-ish or you know anything like that. But it's very unique, and uh, I really dug it. And finally, I just want to mention, uh, Stabbing Westward is uh, putting out new music. They have a new EP out. It's called Dead and Gone. They have three new uh, songs. Plus two remixes. Uh, one of the remixes is a Stoneburner remix, and it's really good. Nice. It's, uh, it's new stuff. It's it was billed as being more electronic and less sort of guitar-y. They really started as a as an electronic, really wax tracks influenced group, and they really got pushed in a more guitar-y, grungy direction uh, as they progressed. And they were, they're sort of heading back to those roots. Um, I, I think it's really good stuff. It's uh, it's very well done, and I don't know. I, I dig those guys now. No, they're good. Yeah. I mean, it. I find, like, sometimes you catch a candid expression of who the artists are, and it will really influence how much you like them. Mm. Like... You probably having seen that that really intimate uh, show with Stabbing Westward, like you probably like him more after that. That was yeah, that was super informative. Not only to see what just Chris and Walter can do together, mm-hmm. which I mean that's the core of the band. That's those are the founders. Uh, just them plus their influences that they wanted to cover was super informative as to what the core of that band really is. So, yeah, it, 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 
it it really informs you on a whole different level about everything else that they've put out. So yeah, that was really cool. That's awesome. It goes the other way sometimes too. Like I always shit on they might be giants because <laughs> I was a huge fan and then I caught them at the Polish community center in Brooklyn and they were dicks. Oh. They were like just fucking full of themselves pompous douchebags and I could never listen to them the same way. Yeah. It was like, oh, they're trying they're just trying to be quirky. Uh, yeah, but it's one of those things where it's not always a good thing to meet the artist, but sometimes it's a very good thing to meet the artist. So True. Mixed bag, bro. Yeah. Monkey's paw. <laughs> Don't never wish to meet the artist. Uh but yeah, good I think you have a good roundup and I'm gonna take note and check out everything you had mentioned. Cause I find that like it's hard to get expo like true like global exposure to new music. Oh yeah, it's impossible with all the shit going on right now. Yeah. You can follow the 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 DAC, the Deutsche Alternative Charts, or you can or you can follow the German Electronic Weekly Charts. Um, those are both pretty good, and like if you're a DJ and you want to know what's going to go over really well, you can just pick something from the top 15 tracks, and I guarantee you it's going to go over really well in your set. But like to find the underground stuff, it's it's just good to have a friend like you, DJ Velocet, <laughs> who hears stuff and passes it on and, you know, it's the good shit. I don't even know if this is anything actually that underground, but, you know, I just, I follow people on Bandcamp. What is it? The the sliding door in the cemetery? What was one? Of, I never heard of that shit. What? <laughs> what? I don't, it was like the second to last thing you said. Rose Garden Funeral Party? Yeah, those dudes, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember how I got onto them. I think they were recommended from something else I liked or had bought. So I checked them out, and they were actually really good. Or maybe they were highlighted on, like, Bandcamp Daily or something like that. Bandcamp is interesting if you follow, like, I don't know if you mess yeah. with following people. I do, yeah. But it is it is cool. You know, you'll, it's you'll find doing. somebody who's quirky who has, like... A particular taste and you just watch what they are consuming and oh you mean fans a, yeah like okay like i i don't always agree but i follow uh jared from who does the resident dj of uh corrosion, corrosion? Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and then like uh i picked up someone started following me who's really into synthwave which is not my primary focus that's interesting but um I guess I have enough. It's like I, if I were looking for synthwave releases, I would absolutely start with this person's like collection. And might be Adam from have. Stoker. He's into synthwave. I don't <laughs> think so, unless he's going through a lot of like trouble to seem like a lady. I don't know. He's he's really into Time Cop, nineteen eighty four, whatever the name of that band is. That was, yeah, that's one of them. I mean, okay. like there's a there's a bunch. It's tough. I feel like I don't exactly understand how people get into synthwave. It's a feeling. Maybe they start with the rain within and they're sucked in by Yeah. You know. It's just it's one of those things where I just don't get it yet. Maybe I will, but at this point I don't understand like I get it. There's like, okay, so you're going to you're going to construct music using a sound library from a point from a period in time. And you're not going you're going to aesthetically be judge judicious about when you will exceed that library. And it might be newer sounds that are just reminiscent of the old sounds. It might not be the genuine old sounds. Right. I mean, yeah. But they're yeah they're you trying to evoke the feeling of that time period which for anyone who grew up in the eighties I mean there's there's a lot of baggage that goes with those sounds and that feeling of you know I always had a certain Cold War fucking dread growing up in the eighties um, 
and you know my parents didn't get along great and shit like that so yeah it, it, feels, it depends it feel on personal funny. yeah exactly mixed there's, feelings there's a lot of 80s worship and i think positively there was this feeling like the future is going to be fucking dope and i think kind of true my feeling now is more it's 2020 it's time for us to start fucking making the future dope starting fucking now elon musk started a while ago that's right <laughs> he, he's making it musky we gotta get on the jam i gotta buy that truck i gotta <laughs> you know definitely gotta put a hundred bucks down and reserve one i would love to see you do that <laughs> well honestly if i had a business that required a truck i would do it yeah start that business i guess so yeah i need a side hustle <laughs> food no trucks. i don't have time for a side a food truck out of the back of one of those <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that is a jank that is a jank made in heaven battery Just, powered falafels bro that's right a, like an electric George Foreman grill <laughs> making massive falafels out the back I think we've diverged from the goth subculture here yeah <laughs> went off on a little tangent but we've been drinking we got a license artistic license bro that's true um but I think that, that's all I got man alright I'm, I'm done this has been a good one. <laughs> yeah, uh, very the fun. Fire, the fire is going out. Our cups are empty, so we'll sign off now, and we'll, hopefully we'll come back at you in February, and uh, might even come back at you from Montreal, but that's Ooh, that's try it. not it, a guarantee. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, happy New Year. Yeah, peace. Peace. Peace out.